So in absolute musical gold, uh, great to see you guys. Listen to this uh, for um, some sold out news, lightningseeds.co.uk if you want to go and see these guys in November and December, but not in Norwich because it's sold out as it is in Cardiff and Oxford and Newcastle and Glasgow. Hull, Manchester, Liverpool, Cambridge. This is cool. This is so cool. You can still get tickets, but get them while you can because they are literally selling out, as I've just said. Uh, Lytham St Anne's on Thursday, the 7th of November. Sheffield, Scarborough, you can still go. Nottingham, Southampton, Bristol, Bexhill towards the end of November. Then into December for Christmas. I mean, what a night out for Christmas. Come in seriously. Come on. Belfast on the 1st of December. It's a Sunday. And the Limelight uh, leads Beckett Student Union on uh, Friday the 6th. And then Tuesday, the 10th Warrington Par Hall yeah. where the Rolling Stones played oh Absolutely. I didn't know that yeah, yeah. they did uh, London O2 Forum Kentish Town well, that's on Friday the 13th all these other dates sold out in um, December Wolverhampton that'll be the big Christmas party because that's the last night of the tour so far unless they do an Oasis mm. and announce some sneaky additional <laughs> Wembley Stadium dates <laughs> how are you Ian? We're keeping that quiet, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm good, actually, yeah. Oh, mate, it's all good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. What's really... not to like about life? Yeah. And I'm really looking forward to, to that tour, actually, that you just said. Touring before Christmas, everyone's in the mood for a party, yeah. and our gigs can be quite party. You've got so. the tunes. And yeah. um, when you say your gigs can be um, quite, quite a party, you're not kidding, because that was evinced here in the middle of the Euros <laughs> when you played live for us. Do you recall that night at all? I do, but a lot of people don't, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what was it like through your lens? It was, uh, it, it was, it was really good actually, because you're always, you know, you wonder. It's not your usual thing, you know, and you're in. You've got this fabulous view and everything, and and then the room filled up. And everyone really got into the party spirit, I think, yeah. Yeah, so um, I can't remember which bit of the yours it was. Was it the, the opening The opening night, wasn't was it? It was the night before remember. Scotland played Germany or the night Shh. of. It was a big night, I remember that, yeah. It was a big... I can't remember it was the night before the final, the night before it all started. <laughs> it was one of the... And I don't even drink anymore. <laughs> but I was heady on the whole, yeah. the whole atmosphere. Um, yeah, because it was the news broadcast, it was everybody, wasn't it? Talk Sport, mm -hmm. Talk Sport 2, Talk. It was uh, us lot and our six radio stations and some people from downstairs from time to time. And um, I, th I think some sneakies from HarperCollins Publishing managed to get up there as well. Uh, and the sun, but it's great, man. Uh, and when you say your gigs can be a party, yes, they can because we've witnessed it. And at Carfest, thank you, by the way. Oh, thank you. What are you doing next year? Forgot. You fancy a bit of Carfest next year? Yeah, we'll be there. Yeah. You, you say the word, oh, we'll mate, be there. No, no, consider it a done deal. That would be amazing. Great. Um, tell us about that. Is it? Do you feel responsible to to get the party going, or does it just happen because the tunes are banging? What what? Where where does it? Where does uh, your artistry, your performative um, responsibilities meet your celebratory true nature? I guess it's taken a long time for me to become. Well, it's taken thirty years, thirty five years for me to actually get comfortable on stage. You know, I started. And I was a bit of a novice, really, because I'd been in the studio and I hadn't really sung in public very much, you know. And after all this time, I finally, I love my band. I love playing the gigs. I think my favourite bit of everything is, you know, arriving somewhere, meeting new people and playing the songs. And at the moment, there's a there's a beautiful feeling between us and our audiences. Yeah. It's just we've arrived at a certain point. You're so funny. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, your, your two bandmates will be... To testify to this. You know what I'm saying, don't you, here, Martin? Yeah. Uh, you are such a slow burn, man. Um, so he's been, he's been writing hits for 35, 40 years, and he suddenly realised being on stage can be fun, right? Uh, we all knew that anyway. And your tunes are so much so fun. Is that because you, were, you weren't confident, you didn't think you were worth it, you low self-esteem issues, you always wear black? I don't know. All those things, yeah, <laughs> very well put. Yeah, but it's interesting, though, isn't it? And now you've embraced it. Isn't it? Yeah, I think it's just um, I feel comfortable there now, you know, and I, I sort of um, Good for you. I think I suppose life has changed around me and whereas I was probably least sure of what I should do on stage, yeah. quite different in life. It's reversed and yeah. now I don't know what I'm doing, but when I'm on stage, I know what I'm meant to do. It's so interesting you say that for so, so many questions. Uh, too long for a radio show, too many for a radio show. But isn't it funny because that maybe that's why your tunes are so joyous because the joy had to be in the music for you, in the studio, in your bedroom, you know, in, in your notebooks, on your guitar, because it couldn't be in your performance. And had you enjoyed performing so much, we wouldn't have these tunes maybe. Possibly. I think maybe... 
I've always felt like I have to try harder in a way because I might not be able to sing it as well as someone else might. So I better make sure the melody and the feeling of it. I always wanted, you know, when I was first writing Lightning Seed songs, <clears throat> I wanted them to all be like Andy Warhol pictures on a wall, nice. like splashes of pop colour. Beautiful, beautiful. You know, and just moments that would be captured that you could just hang somewhere. So now down the line it feels it's good actually because it feels like the gigs are like that we can we can space them out and put things in between them and kind of count on those moments usually wow i mean that's great that's poetic and it's strategic <laughs> which is andy warhol all over mission accomplished mate congratulations so cool so cool i mean pure is a perfect pop song you know perfect pop songs um across the universe the beatles um god only knows the beach boys stairway to heaven not so much a pop song but a perfect song um video kill the radio star buggles you know what i'm saying yeah yeah um well, i'm thanks sure thanks for including me in that no bunch, no but yeah. i yeah i can you can't because you couldn't say that about yourself well you could but it's not like you uh, but i mean you are I think in many ways you are Trevor Horn, not dissimilar. You know, um, when you're writing a perfect pop song like that, is it more is it more sort of architectural, or does it still come from the heart? Is it a bit of both? I think it could, there's sort of three phases to the to it, and it, and it's always from the heart, and it's all it's all from the heart. I mean, Pure's a strange song because I think it's the first song that I kind of um, it was our first single, and when I wrote it. I kind of stopped. I always feel like the unfinished song has a kind of power because it's never been, it still owns its possibilities. Yeah, work in, in progress. And uh, with Pure, I kind of, I wrote it and I, I was doing the vocal and I thought, oh, I've done this wrong. There's too many words, you know, there's too many words for a song. People won't be able to grasp it. So I stopped and I didn't finish it. And then someone heard it and said, at the time I didn't have, a record contract or a manager or a band or anything at all. And he said, oh, you know, I, I love this song. You know, I'd like to get 200 of them pressed up and put it out. And I was like, well, it's not finished yet. I'll, I'll finish it. And he was like, no, no, it, which was the best thing he ever said, actually. Don't touch it, you know. And I was like, well, I want to, you know, it's got all a bit of the beginning. And he was like, no, don't touch it. Just put it out. So that's the only song I've ever released that's not finished. And it's my favourite. And it sort of retains a certain... Je ne sais quoi because of that, I think. We were talking about agency before, about the fact that the simpler the cartoon character, the more kids fall in love with a character because they can paint their own personality onto that character, which is why the smiley face is so universally loved. Um, they say the same in movies about Thelma and Louise. So they say the genius about Thelma and Louise is you don't you see them drive off the cliff, but you don't see what happens next, right, and they no, might maybe, survive. Yeah. And it's the same with Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Mm -hmm. And you know, and for Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, see Thurman Louise, and for Thurman Louise, see Pure. Right. Boom, and the smiley face. Yeah. And who doesn't want to be in that gang? Yeah. Thurman Louise, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, to the soundtrack of the Lightning Seeds with the backdrop of a smiley face. <laughs> Welcome to Friday, everyone. <laughs> uh, gosh, uh, who doesn't want to see this tour, by the way? Here we go, lightningseeds.co.uk to go and see Lightning Seeds November and December. Ian, it says here, Ian Brady, 66. Clearly, that's a typo. You can't be 66 yeah. years old. That's how I feel about it, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, I was listening to a friend of mine talking the other day on a podcast, which I love, and she said, she's 70, she just turned 70, and she said her 60s set her free. And she said that, and because she never lies about anything ever, and she's a brilliant writer, and everything she says comes from so deep down, from beyond the beyond, it just set, it did begin to set me free and I started looking forward to my 60th. I wasn't not looking forward to it anyway. You're 66. Can you, can you either uh, confirm or deny what she may have offered up there? Yeah, I kind of know what she's talking about. I think one, I sort of resolved, you know, you get to a certain point and you think, I, you know, I want to enjoy all the moments as they happen. Because yeah. a lot of the time, you know, you sort of look back and chuckle. And I think when you get to your 60s, you think, right, I'm, I want to be in this moment fully yeah. and experience it. And in a way, that does set you free. You start to relax and come into a, a sort of zone that you haven't really, you didn't really know you weren't in. She said that she just stopped worrying about most things because it's all nonsense. Um, and that's also set, helped set her free. Yeah, I think, uh, 
you know, you could, if you were being ironic, you could say it's a bit too late to worry. But uh, you know, and 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 that's that frees you in a way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I honestly, I can't tell you how. I mean, I'm pretty, I'm quite excitable anyway. You know that. Um, but I'm so looking forward to being sixty and just smashing sixty-one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, they say that TFI Friday started in 1996, um, and they said you know it defined the 90s. And, you know, I don't really give interviews about that, but if I did, and I used to, but I don't so much anymore, um, I say, yeah, the, but we didn't really. I said, but basically what we did was we jumped on the bus that was already the 90s because you can't really define a decade until it's at least halfway through because it's still sorting itself out. Do you know what I mean by that? I do, but I think you kind of did to a degree and it, maybe you don't know you're driving the bus at the time. Do you know what I mean? No, but I, I think we were, we ended up driving the bus, but the bus had already left the depot, if you know what I mean. Because if you think about the Beatles, 66. You hijacked the bus. Yeah, exactly. Of course we did. At 66, you know, that's really when they exploded. You know, you get your Pink Floyds and you get your Deep Purples and your Led Zeppelin. 76. It's all, it's, do you know what I mean by that? 85, 86. And it's, I'm getting to the point that you're 66 again. Yeah. Right, so you're you're just over your, your seventh decade. How does it, how does that fit? How does it land in with you? I felt okay a minute ago. Sorry, I didn't mean, no, but I'm trying to get, I'm trying to sort of get, uh, benefit yeah. from your wisdom. No, I mean I I feel good, and I feel like certainly as a musician, you know, we're the first genera- generation of musicians who, like, I remember when I was a kid, my dad saying, reading the paper and saying, Rolling Stones are still doing gigs at the 28. You know, what are they playing at? <laughs> You know, who do they think they are? You know, and it, and the concept, you know, the sort of general idea was, you know, you, you have a couple of songs out and you pack in when you're 25, Smash don't it. you? You blow you up. You go and work somewhere Off and, you and go. that's it, yeah. And, uh, of course, this generation, possibly because of technology and YouTube and things last forever, really. Yeah. Things are on the net. They last forever. You're in touch with the people, you know, whereas previously maybe you couldn't, it was, wasn't as easy to get in touch. So we're a generation of musicians who feels like we're never going to stop yeah. and I'm never going to stop. And I know that, you? you know, yeah. Um, so it's, it, we're kind of at the forefront of that. So I feel like that with my life as well. I feel like, well, no one's been 66 in 2024. Yeah. So I better figure it out. And yeah. I can, you know, there's a lot more, you know, it feels like there's endless possibilities. Lead the charge. It's funny because, um, Mark um, Knopfler was on the show a couple of months ago and he, speaking about the 80s, speaking to the 80s, Die Straits didn't form until they were 28. Wow. You know, they were, in a, they were a pub band. Yeah. And, and they, got, they were playing in various pub bands. And that also speaks to what you're saying there. It was a different horizon. You know, and thank God it's still available to us all. Um, thanks for being here, you guys. Thank you so you're much. Amazing. Lovely chatting. We love you. Lightningseas.co.uk if you want to go and see the Lightning Seas in November and December. Um, and if you want to go in Oxford, Newcastle, Glasgow, Cardiff, Norwich, Hull, Manchester, Liverpool, Cambridge, you're going to have to look to go somewhere else because I sold that. <laughs> travel, travel. <laughs> You're gonna have to get in your car. You go from hey to rock and roll uh, or pop tastic beat and have a great time. Virgin Radio.